Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Real Visions The Archives. This week I've selected a video titled Virtualization, the next big multi-year theme. It's from back in 2017 and Mike Green sat down with Dan Arbus. Dan has some really unique experience in that he was one of the few lawyers from the West on the ground in Eastern Europe when they restructured from communism to capitalism. And they discussed that uh, in relation to what's been happening in China over the past few years. Now remember this is from 2017, so it is a little dated in that part. But at eight minutes, they start talking about Dan's big bets on virtualization and on the internet of things. If you've been paying close attention, he really got that one right. And since COVID has accelerated a lot of the trends he's talking about, I thought it was a perfect time to pull this one out of the archives for all of you to see if you hadn't seen it recently. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mike Green and Dan Arvis. The big moment that everybody's been waiting for in China, where Chinese consumers are a player and a magnet for everybody's production, uh, and China becomes a consumer economy. I really believe that our generation is still missing the foundational changes that are taking place in the economy and in the whole world being wrought by technology. People are becoming anxious, both existentially about their security, which I'll come back to in a moment, and economically. excited today to meet with Dan Arvis. Dan is a friend of mine who's been involved in the industry for a long time, starting back in the late 1980s and early 1990s when he was the youngest Western lawyer on the ground in Eastern Europe. He had the unique opportunity to sit with the governments of Russia and Czechoslovakia in the process of restructuring their nationally held companies into, pro into publicly traded vehicles. Dan brought that perspective on the fall of communism and the insights that actually predicted the fall of communism to his investing career and it continues to be a big picture investor who invests across long arcs. As we see some of the dynamics that I've talked about in other interviews, this idea that perhaps the curtain is closing again and the world is reversing, I'm really excited to get Dan's perspective on what's happening out there and where he sees the opportunities today. Dan, friend, mentor, so excited to have you here to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Delighted to be here. Well, what do you see now as you see the Chinese are placing increasing emphasis on SOEs and reducing the impact of the market economy, even as they give lip service to the idea of reform, right? The Czech Republic or Poland or many areas in Eastern Europe, Russia, for example, have dramatically reversed this. And um, both you and I share a love for Ayn Rand and, and the ideas behind independence. Um, so this feels very much like something that isn't part of the natural circle, but it seems to be playing out. Do you, do you not see that or do you see that as well? I see, you know, it's such a pleasure to talk to you, whether it's on camera or off camera, because you're such a brilliant thinker. Packed into the question that you just asked, are layers and layers and layers of developments that I believe all point back in one direction. So um, remember that I said that I'm, I'm a big multi-year idea guy. Yep. So I've only invested in four or five big ideas and implemented my understanding of those developments. In a, for, you know. What we're showing you here on our YouTube channel is just the tip of the iceberg. No matter where you are in your financial journey, whether you're a beginner just looking to break into the market or a financial professional looking to up your game, Real Vision has something for everyone. Every day our team of expert journalists provides in-depth analysis, written reports, access to live streams, and access to our community, The Exchange, where you can interact with people just like you from all over the world. For just one dollar, you can unlock all of this and more at realvision.com. Try our essential tier. If you like what you see, it's only 20 bucks a month thereafter. So click on the link in the description, go to realvision.com, and see what you think. We look forward to seeing you there. Guy. Yep. So I've only invested in four or five big ideas and implemented my understanding of those developments in a, in a variety of ways in you know, thousands and thousands of positions and trades over the last 15 years. 
So the evolution of the devolution of communism from Europe to Asia through China's industrialization, urbanization, which involved a lot of fixed asset investment, and most recently the transition to the big moment that everybody's been waiting for in China, where Chinese consumers are a player and a magnet for everybody's production, uh, and China becomes a consumer economy. The arc of that is something that I followed for the past almost 30 years now. Along the way I did, you know, I got the housing crisis, as you know. Mm -hmm. When I was looking for an asymmetric way to get short the housing speculation after trying to do it by shorting stock in the home builders too early in 2005, I remembered the mortgage CDO structure and went out to look for mezzanine tranches of mortgage CDOs to buy protection on. So I got the housing short. It was very, very clear in the fourth quarter of 2008 that there was going to be a huge opportunity in reflation because when you saw the Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson on his knees begging Nancy Pelosi for congressional action, it was very clear that Congress was going to be incapable of taking the steps that were going to be necessary to rescue the financial system and to rescue the economy. So it was absolutely going to fall to monetary policy and to the central bank. And if you listened carefully to thoughtful people in the fourth quarter of 2008, I remember Jim Bianco in particular being brilliant on this. There was all kinds of signals that there would be extraordinary monetary policy. And you could connect the dots pretty quickly to understand what exactly that was going to be after interest rates were brought down to the zero bound. It was going to have to be quantitative easing. And so I made the call in 08 after being short housing, long mining for China on the weak dollar, which did beautifully in 07 and 08. So it was up 40 mm -hmm. in 07 and up in 08. In the fourth quarter of 08, I said, okay, now it's time to flip and go long financial assets from investment grade credit all the way down to equities that are going to benefit from financial market reflation that's going to come from uh, unconventional monetary policy. So 09 was a terrific year. Okay. Along the way, there were other big ideas like shale, like Abenomics. But by 2014, the big ideas were getting smaller. There was one huge idea, I'm going to come back to your question now, that was becoming apparent to me, which was that the penetration of software and services, the potential penetration of software and services into traditional industries was very likely going to bring big displacements, big cost reductions, labor displacement and capital displacement because you could achieve efficiencies in traditional industries with software and services that don't require capex. So back to your question of what's going on in the world, we are in the middle, in my view, and I think our generation to some extent overlooks this because we are all in our heuristics, in our mindsets that we learned when our worldviews were formed, whether it was in the late 70s or in the early 80s, the world is a completely different place. Normally, everybody likes to look backward at what they did before and then make adjustments based on you know, what they have to to accommodate the most limited change that's, that's taken place. I really believe that our generation is still missing the foundational changes that are taking place in the economy and in the whole world being wrought by technology. And what I mean by that is you had an economic transformation 150 years ago of an agrarian economy where the, the focus of the economy and the growth in the economy transferred from the farm to factory and services. We are in the midst now of a completely new economic transformation as significant as the Industrial Revolution was, where we are moving from 
factory and services, which are labor intensive and capital intensive, to information and process, data, which is not capital intensive and not labor intensive. So what is happening around us is jobs are being displaced by technological process. People are becoming anxious, both existentially about their security, which I'll come back to in a moment, and economically, because they see, oh, the unemployment rate is down, which in my view is, is completely incomplete. What's much more relevant is the participation level in the job market is at the lowest point in decades. And the participation rate in the job market, especially for young people in the prime of their working age, 25 to 60 to 54, I believe it is, is the lowest that it's ever been. So what's going on here? People are available to work. They're out of the work market. Some people say, well, that's because the baby boomer generation is retiring. Not true. Baby boomer generation participation is higher than expected. What's happening is new graduates are not getting jobs. Why? Because jobs are being displaced. And it's not just manufacturing factory floor jobs. It's white collar jobs. It's legal jobs. It's data and analysis job, jobs all being displaced. So at the same time, the same technological forces are making information readily available to everybody for free. So this is, this is a tension that you're describing though, right? Because on one hand, it sets the stage for tremendous gains in productivity, which potentially leads to significant rises in standards of living, right? Um, reduced capital investment, reduced labor investment for the same output fundamentally is a good outcome, right? But when it leads to this type of insecurity that you're talking about, it creates counteractions, right? The, the political state emerges to reassert control from the corporate actors um, who are exploiting these loopholes and try to reestablish that security, right? And so it, it, well, the, there's the, a feedback the, loop. The, the culture really is has become, and maybe always was, but certainly in my lifetime that I've been following political culture, 40 years now or more, okay? The culture is to express regret about change and look for uh, someone to attach blame or responsibility for the change to, rather than embracing change as positive and seeing what can be done with it. So what you have right now is very genuine anxiety about headwinds to job creation and job growth, because it is true. Technology should be improving productivity. Per unit of labor, you're getting a lot more, okay? The problem is we're a consumer economy. Over 75% of our GDP is driven by consumption People that don't have jobs don't consume. That stands to reason. So if you want the consumer economy to thrive, we need to be thinking about where jobs are going to come from in this new information and data analytics economy. And that's the problem. You have the Treasury Secretary of the United States saying, I don't see job displacement by technology as being a problem in my lifetime. It's actually happening today. And then on the other hand, you've got some very thoughtful people who are, in, you know, who are closest to the technology, like Mark Zuckerberg, talking about, OK, if there aren't enough jobs for everybody, we'll have universal basic income and we'll just put money in people's pocket. There's a couple of problems with that concept. One, which I think is the most important, is it's undignified for the recipients just to receive handouts. And two is the obvious question of where are you going to get the money to put in people's pockets? That opens a door to redistribution, which brings me right back to kind of the Bernie Sanders direction that the Democratic Party in this country is moving toward. I have lived through and looked very closely at the impact of government in controlling and managing businesses. And I'm here to tell you, having dismantled it in a number of countries, at the level of dozens of specific enterprises, it doesn't work. 
So the notion of governmental redistribution, governmental renationalization of business, government's involvement in the microeconomy, bad idea. Not gonna, is the road to perdition. We, we should have already learned that from the devolution of communism. That was a system that didn't work. State engagement in the microeconomy at the level of the enterprise does not work because state actors do not have the same incentives as private sector, actor, sector actors and shareholders. They just don't. So I 100% agree with you. I think your point about insecurity and the importance, it's not so much that people want jobs, and this is what Mark Zuckerberg's tapping into, right? Nobody, you and I want jobs because we love what we do, right? But the vast majority of people really don't want to show up on an auto assembly line. Right? What they're really saying is I want to increase my consumption or maintain consumption at a level that is above what my savings currently allow me to do, right? Um, and so there is this, this alternate solution, right? You can go to something like universal basic income to solve it, you turn to the state, right? Um, and, and you're correctly, 100% agree with you, pointing out that it doesn't work, that ultimately, in the immortal words of Maggie Thatcher, the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money, right? <laughs> Look, I think with respect, I may disagree with you on the premise. I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the American voter and for people in general. So I take issue with the proposition that people don't want jobs. They may not want repetitive task jobs. Totally agree. They may not want boring jobs, but I believe that all people, when they wake up in the morning, want at some point, want purpose. They want to do something that makes a positive difference to someone somewhere whether it's love their family, love their children, help other people. People don't want to sit in a chair and receive handouts. People want to get up and do something. And it's the role of thought leaders in society, whether they're political leaders or they're market leaders or they're whatever they are, to think about the future of society strategically, not like what's it, what does it mean for me, for my taxes or for whatever, Think about how we will give purpose to people, give opportunity to people to define purpose that will allow for the cohesion of society to stabilize and increase, whereas it's going in the other direction right now. You, you, you've highlighted this, th that, that there's this opportunity to deploy many of these technologies and insights from data management, data libraries, um, data acquisition into the traditional industrial world. How did, how, how did that emerge and, and how do you see that is an investable theme. Okay, it's forward. just starting to take place now. What's happened is you've got hundreds of startup companies that are involved in different aspects of what I call the Internet of Things arc, which is censoring, processing, analyzing data, and making cloud-based remote changes to the industrial process to either preempt maintenance or improve the efficiency, which leads to margin improvement. You do this, it displaces labor, it displaces CapEx because the customer in the end wants to buy a service. The sellers of the components of the service, whether it's routers or other hardware or software, want to sell components. There is a huge opportunity in consolidating a holistic solution of all of these fragments and introducing it across industries. I spent a lot of time earlier this year uh, working on a micro irrigation company, which is basically in the business of selling hardware, drip lines. They invented drip irrigation. We're in a water crisis in the world. Drip irrigation is much more efficient. The company was put up for auction by Goldman. It was sold for an extremely high multiple that we wouldn't pay, okay, to Mexichem because Mexichem, I believe, wants to sell more drip lines through its drip line network in India and China. But the real opportunity for that company and many other companies and many other industries is to turn the company from a seller of hardware 
into a cellar of water solutions, whereby censoring the irrigation process and optimizing nutrients and the right pressure and amount of water at different line, uh, points in the drip line delivering water to the crop, you will be able to get more crop per drop, which has very specific economic value. So you introduce this to the grower as a service. Not go to the grower and say, hey, you could put all these pieces together because they don't know how to do it. They're, they, they, you know, they're not an integrator, but you do it for them. You do it for uh, them and you, and you provide them a service and take a share of the economic value added that you contribute. This is a gigantic idea that I've sort of developed through my travels in studying this, which is all I've been doing for the past three years and making venture investments in different components. There is the need for integration, but more importantly, for application to traditional industries. And I can give you a list of hundred probably but certainly a handful of public companies that I'm already investing in that are about to benefit from this whole thing. And so this is a variant, I mean, this is similar to the dynamic we've seen with Workspace or with, with the software as a service um, type model, but you're saying extended to Caterpillar tractors and to drip to, irrigation. To, to, to all kinds of process. In other words, to, to take pieces of hardware, integrate them with software and data analytics to provide a, a greater service outcome without the need for capital expenditure. I mean, another whole area of opportunity is telecom network function virtualization, mm -hmm. okay, which is basically the movement of telecom infrastructure to the cloud. As we know, the relationship between telecom customers and telecom providers has been completely disrupted because voice communication has no value anymore. It's given away with data and even data, even mobile data. As you saw in the last quarter, Verizon blew its quarter because its competitors were giving away unlimited data service in favor of getting app traffic. So the people who are benefiting from this whole dynamic in the telecom industry are the app developers who are attracting the advertisers and getting the advertising revenue from the advertisers. So what the telecom guys need to do is they need to restore their direct relationship with the end users, whether it's enterprise or retail customers, and they need to do that by offering applications directly over their networks, and they need to get away from the plain old telephone service, copper wires, which Frankly, on the block where I live in Manhattan, there's been no service for a, you know two years because Con Edison cut the copper wires. Verizon doesn't want to bother fixing them because there's no value in retail customers for voice, and they haven't gotten around to provisioning FiOS to our block of Manhattan. And so this is going to be the tension, and it's what I'd love to come back and be able to revisit with you, right? I mean, so. One thing that you're highlighting is, is that the real opportunity for you is to pursue this in the private markets where you can exert control again. It goes back to this control premium that you highlighted in Eastern Europe that you saw emerging, right? The corporate control. It's in premium. the private markets, but it's also through um, persuasion and influence and being in the right place to where the technology solutions are going to be implemented for the benefit of public companies. So I'm back in public markets with my own capital now investing in companies that stand to benefit from this dynamic. Some of which companies already are involved in it in some way, some of which are getting involved in it because they're being asked by their clients to add a more comprehensive integrated service. But they're all going to be moving in this direction. So if you can get to the, you know, to the, to the summit and plant the flag early, which is what I've always done in my career, sometimes too early, for the structures that I've been working in, the hedge funds, which we haven't talked about the hedge fund structure. But if you can get there at the right time with the right patience, this is a value added investment opportunity. It is not a trade. It's not even a private equity investment. It's gonna take as long as it takes to change people's mindsets and culture to have them adapt to what's going on around them. And you can't put that on a calendar. It could take a month, could take a year, could take seven years, could take 10 years, but it's going to be 
the returns from this strategy will be disproportionately large relative to what we've been used to looking at for the last 10 years, at least. Because well, that, this, is an, an, this is a situation where there's unskied terrain. There's opportunity for fresh tracks. They haven't, it hasn't been all skied up. It hasn't been everybody doing it yet. It's just starting. Well, it's like the stress credit 15 years ago. Yep. Well, and what you're describing ultimately is organic growth through a form of vertical integration. You're just capturing pieces of your client's value chain. And so, that, so that's the opportunity that you see. You're back in the public markets. You're enjoying yourself. You see fantastic opportunity. Most are concerned, but it's great to hear that you see a path towards higher profits. Um, any chance I can get you to come back in about a year to, to revisit it and see where we are? Absolutely. It'd be my privilege, rain or shine. If it works or it doesn't, we can talk about why it didn't work or why it did work or what the status is. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Sam. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.